A Fox Urgent now. A senior official telling Fox News the U.S. will withdraw from the United Nations Human Rights Council. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo set to make it official just a few hours from now. Trump administration officials have threatened to do this for months now, and they say it's because of Israel. Ambassador Haley says the Human Rights Council has treated Israel worse than Iran, Syria, and even North Korea over the conflict with Palestinians. Just yesterday, the U.N.'s top human rights official criticized the Trump administration's zero-tolerance immigration, uh, immigration policy that's led to the separation of undocumented children from their parents. There are many terrible things happening in the world today, many things that demand our urgent attention. As we speak, protesters are taking, are taking, protests are taking place in Nicaragua. Over 146 peaceful Nicaraguans have been killed by their own government in the past two months. But we're not talking about Nicaragua today. The people of Iran have been protesting their government for months. Thousands of peaceful Iranian protesters have been arrested. Over 25 are dead. But we're not talking about Iran either. The world's worst humanitarian crisis is going on right now in Yemen. Millions are at risk for starvation. In Burma, almost a million innocent people have been driven from their homes in a campaign of ethnic cleansing. But we're not talking about Yemen or Burma. Instead, today, the General Assembly is devoting its valuable time to the situation in Gaza. Gaza is an important international matter. But what makes it different and more urgent than conflicts in Nicaragua, Iran, Yemen, Burma, or many other desperate places? Because we haven't gathered here to discuss any of those urgent issues. The United States would welcome that. What makes Gaza different for some is that attacking Israel is their favorite political sport. That's why we're here today. The nature of this resolution clearly demonstrates that politics is driving the day. It is totally one-sided. It makes not one mention of Hamas, who routinely initiates violence in Gaza. Such one-sided resolutions at the UN do nothing to advance peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Everyone recognizes that. But advancing peace is not the goal of this resolution. I suspect even my Turkish friends know the passage of this resolution won't change anything, but that it looks good for the people back home to think they're doing something. That is pure politics. In fact, this resolution makes peace less possible. It feeds a narrative to the desperate people of Gaza that their leaders are not responsible for their predicament. It stokes hatred. It sacrifices honesty, accuracy, compromise, and reconciliation in favor of the advancement of a narrow political agenda. If we were being honest, we would acknowledge that there are no perfect actors on either side of this conflict. But it does no one any good to pretend that all the blame lies on one side. I wish everyone supporting this one-sided resolution would put as much energy into encouraging President Abbas to come to the negotiating table as you do to falsely imply to your people back home that you're doing something. Israel withdrew completely from Gaza in 2005. Hamas has been the de facto government in Gaza since 2007. This strip of land along the Mediterranean coast has enormous potential. And yet, after 11 years of Hamas rule, Gaza has electricity for only a few hours a day. It has enormous unemployment and poverty. It is a haven for terrorist activity. At what point will the UN actually hold accountable those who are in charge of Gaza and running it into the ground? Instead, this resolution holds Hamas completely unaccountable for most of the recent unrest. It blames everything on Israel, but the facts 
tell a different story. It is Hamas and its allies that have fired over 100 rockets into Israel in the past month, hoping to cause death to as many civilians and as much destruction as possible. It is Hamas that has used Palestinian civilians as human shields at the boundary fence, seeking to incite violence and overrun the border. It is Hamas that refuses to cooperate with the Palestinian Authority to unite in the pursuit of peace. It is Hamas that calls for the destruction of the state of Israel within any borders. And yet, the resolution before us not only fails to blame Hamas for these actions, it fails to even mention Hamas. This is the dangerous, counterproductive decision the General Assembly is about to take. But there is still a chance for this body to try and right this wrong. We still have the opportunity to salvage something honest from this discussion. The United States is offering an amendment that provides a small step in the direction of balance. Our amendment rightly condemns Hamas's indiscriminate firing of rockets into Israeli civilian communities. It accurately condemns the diversion of aid and resources from civilian needs into military infrastructure, including terror tunnels used to attack Israeli citizens. It justly expresses our grave concerns about damage done to border crossings that are hindering the delivery of desperately needed food and fuel to the people of Gaza. This is a modest amendment that reflects the minimum truth of what is going on in Gaza. It is the least that any self-respecting international organization or nation can do for the cause of peace. To those who are unsure about how to vote, I ask, what part of our amendment is objectionable? Is it objectionable to condemn Haas for firing the rockets at civilians? Is it objectionable to condemn the diversion of resources from civilians to military uses? Or is it objectionable to express concern about the destruction of border crossings that deliver life-saving supplies? Today's choice for the General Assembly is simple. It is the choice between using our time here to advance peace and security or using it to stoke hatred and conflict. This vote will tell us much about which countries are serious about accuracy and reconciliation and which countries are bound by their political agendas. For the sake of peace and for the sake of this institution, I urge my colleagues to support the United States Amendment. Thank you. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us. The Lord is indeed gracious, and Jesus is indeed coming soon. As always, we monitor world events with a particular focus on the Middle East concerning the prophecies of nothing less than the Word of God. We always examine world events and developments in the Middle East in light of the predictions of Scripture for the last days. But let's begin. Continuing its program of what would seem to be courage and integrity in the estimation of many people, including many American evangelicals and Christians globally, the Trump administration through Nikki Haley and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has announced the American withdrawal, the United States withdrawal, from the UN Commission on Human Rights, which has historically been something of a farce. Just like the United Nations Disarmament Commission, the biggest violators have been seated on the commission. Some of the nations with the grossest, ugliest record of human rights abuses sit on the commission and use the position on the commission to deflect any diplomatic criticism or legal criticism of their own actions. But it has continually found Israel as the scapegoat and made Israel the focus of the nature of their complaints of human rights violations, ignoring the human rights violations of the surrounding countries, such as Iran, various Arab countries, Islamic countries, and so forth, and ignoring the fact that Israel is a functional democracy with a much better human rights record, certainly a better women's rights record, Christian rights record, etc. 
than the surrounding nations. The Trump administration had had enough of the hypocrisy, not only of the internecine corruption of the Human Rights Commission, but their singling out of Israel, and the United States has greatly damaged the prestige of this UN body by withdrawing this week in prophecy. We say well done to the Trump administration, and again, our continual prayers not only for President Trump and Vice President Pence, but also for Mike Pompeo, who is a believer, and for Nikki Haley. Uh, she's a woman of some integrity oh. and ability. God bless her. And again, these things are of prophetic significance. It does show that as the nations gather against Israel in fulfillment of the predictions of Zechariah chapter 12, that for the moment at least, the United States is no longer going that way as it did under Barack Obama. The pandering to radical Islamic and human rights violating regimes in Iran and so forth, that was the mainstay of the corrupt Obama administration with Samantha Powers and, and Susan Rice and others, is no longer the order of the day in Washington or in New York or in Geneva. This week in prophecy, we see a definite step in that direction. This week in prophecy, regional governments of Spain, as Spain is tilted towards the political left in the latest elections, although it is a minority coalition, has seen adaptation in uh, Navarra state towards the BDS boycotts against Israel. Again, it shows local socialist governments in states or regions, that is effectively provinces of Spain, moving in the direction against Israel, forgetting the Islamic attacks that took place in Madrid. This happens as Spain continues to fragment between its Basque, its Catholic population in Barcelona, and the mainstream of Spanish politics and ethnicity situated in Madrid. Spain is in many ways a fragmenting country, politically and sociologically. Unfortunately, much of the support for the anti-Israel movement comes from the Basques. These are the Celtic populations of northwest Spain and adjoining areas. Similar to other Celtic independence movements, particularly the provisional IRA in Northern Ireland, there is a sympathy towards Palestinian nationalism, mistaking their quest with the quest towards things like Irish republicanism, Welsh nationalism, independence for Scotland, and of course the desire to have an independent Basque state uh, in, in Spain, remembering of the Etna terror, which was very similar to the IRA that took place in Spain with various bombings and so forth, they have found a kindred spirit for some time <coughs> with Palestinian Islamic nationalism. It is a complete revisionist misinterpretation of history and a misunderstanding of their own history in relationship to what's actually taking place in the Middle East. If one was to look ideologically and historically, they would see that they have more in common with the Israelis than they do with the Muslims. The Irish, the Basques, the even Cornish, but particularly the Irish, the Basques, Scottish, and Welsh nationalists, all resist England, Britain, led by England, in their own desire for a national identity and country. Well, it was Israel, likewise, who strove against the British to forge their own identity and country in the aftermath of the Second World War on the heels of the revocation of the Belfour Declaration. It is also a fact that the Celtic peoples of the Basque provinces in Spain, like those in Northern Ireland, Wales and elsewhere, as, as, and of course Scotland, point to the fact that they are the indigenous people forgetting that the Jews, the Israelites, are the indigenous people of Israel. Again, it is a completely convoluted misreading of history and a misunderstanding of their own history in light of the history of Israel and Islamic nationalism. Nonetheless, it is what is taking place. The fact that you have such a revisionist misinterpretation of history in Europe, particularly by the Celts, 
Now, I say this cautiously. My own family is a mixture of Irish and Jewish. I am certainly pro-Israeli, but I am also pro-Celt, but with an honest and fair and balanced perspective, which is not what we've seen in Spain this week in prophecy, nor is it what we see with the provisional IRA and left-wing governments in the Republic of Ireland. Let us press on this week in prophecy. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, backed strongly by the United States, as we reported last week in Prophecy, have now com completed their conquest of airport and port facilities in Yemen. This has essentially alienated the Houthi rebels logistically from being resupplied by Iran in any high-profile manner. This is not to say that Iranian support cannot continue but it cannot continue so conspicuously and uninterrupted as it did with our access to those port and airport facilities. It is a step forward and it is largely coordinated by the United States. More on this now as we look at a concordat of economic aid supported by the United States between some of the Emirates of Saudi Arabia coming to the economic assistance of Jordan essentially bailing out the Jordanian economy. Jordan has a $700 million budget deficit aggravated by the influx of refugees coming from Syria, where over a half million Syrians have been killed by their own government, Assad, and his regime, in league with Iran and with the backing of, Ms. of Mr. Putin's Russia driving millions of refugees across the Middle East, many of them arriving into Europe. The one country in the Middle East, as we've been reporting, that has absorbed significant numbers of refugees from Syria has been Jordan. But as their numbers have swelled, the toll on the Iranian economy that is already troubled has become quite critical. This is not only seen economically in fiscal terms, but also in terms of Jordan's infrastructure and its ongoing drought and water shortage crisis. The two billion plus aid, two and a half, sorry, the two and a half billion plus aid from the wealthier oil states has, however, come with a condition. In fact, a series of conditions that Jordan has been required to agree to. King Abdullah of Jordan has announced that Jordan will acquiesce to these demands, and it's not a situation where he has much economic or political alternative to doing so. But it's quite interesting, in terms of biblical prophecy, what these stipulations for this aid are. Now, let us remember that Saudi Arabia and the, and the Emirates do not want Syrian refugees. They do not want any Arab Muslim refugees. They prefer to see these people sent to Jordan, or better yet, to the West. Let the infidel take care of them. They don't want their own people. They don't care about their own people. This, again, demonstrates the moral and ethical bankruptcy of the Islamic fundamentalist mentality. These fundamentalist regimes are more than willing to turn their back on other Arab Muslims who are homeless refugees and the victims of war within the Arab world. This brings further indictment to the absolutely bogus claims of the Koran of the doctrine of Ummah, that Muslims are one nation and one people. They are a divided nation and a divided people, especially the Arabs, as we see in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. Once again, Ishmael's seed will be divided and Esau's sword against his brother. Arab Muslims killing Arab Muslims. Jihad and Jihad of Muslims killing each other in the Sunni-Shia divide. And then wealthy Arab oil states with fundamentalist Islamic governments refusing to accept Arab Muslim refugees, dumping them on the poorest country in the region without the oil resources, Jordan, or also letting them go to Europe and to the West. 
Hence, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have a vested interest in keeping these people out of their countries. They don't want their own kind. Let them go to Jordan. We'll give chicken feed handouts to Jordan. But at the same time, we will extract concessions for doing this. Now, the American government has been supportive of this. The United States wants to sustain King Abdullah II of Jordan in power. He is a essentially Bedouin Hashemite king and ruler of a predominantly Palestinian Arab Muslim country that is 70% Palestinian Arab, even though it is a Hashemite Bedouin country of which he is the leader. He only has a 30% base demography in his own people, the rest being Palestinian Arabs. On top of that now, the refugees arriving from Syria. He is in a very difficult position, which explains his choicelessness in acquiescing to the demands of the Saudis and the Emirates. Well, let's understand how this works. The conditions that have been placed upon him to receive this aid include the following. One, Jordan must be strategically supportive of the anti-Houthi endeavors of Saudi Arabia against the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen. They must also pull away diplomatically from any kind of cooperation strategically also with Qatar. Qatar has a very significant Shia population and has warned to Iran, even though it is on the western coast of the Gulf, of the Persian Gulf. This has troubled Saudi Arabia and the other Emirates. The United States attempted to broker some kind of resolution to these infightings between Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Qatar without a lot of diplomatic success. Ultimately, the United States, because of the Iranian factor, has opted to close one of its main bases in Qatar, an Air Force base uh, that was needed for American operations even in Iraq. These things are being redeployed and these air forces are being relocated to other facilities in the region, again concerning Qatar. Hence, Jordan will have to also pull away from Qatar. But in this, there is again the Iran factor. There must also be something that is quite remarkable. A downgrading of any Jordanian support or even accommodation for the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, if anyone understands Middle East affairs, they understand the poison of the Muslim Brotherhood that has been responsible for everything from the development of Hamas to the assassination of Anwar Sadat and more. The Muslim Brotherhood has also had sustained links with the Council of American Islamic Relations in the United States. We now see a firm action with American pressure helping to buttress it against the Muslim Brotherhood. This is another condition being placed on the government of Jordan. They're also being required to cut any remaining effective links of cooperation they have with the Assad regime in Syria. Not that these have really been blossoming to begin with, but there is now a new pressure on Jordan to have essentially the basic minimum of contact diplomatically with the Assad regime. They must have some, as it is the next door neighbor, but there is no friendly cooperation that will be allowed to continue under the terms of the agreement bringing the economic assistance into Jordan. Lastly, and most importantly, and this is remarkable and of huge prophetic significance, the Saudi Arabians and the Emirates have told the government of Jordan and His Majesty King Abdullah that they must cut ties with the Palestinian Authority and the Abbas regime, seeing them as an obstacle to peace in the region and an impediment 
to any peaceful accords that are being attempted or are going to be attempted by the Trump administration. You see now a hardcore turning of Saudi Arabia and the oil-rich Emirates, even economically and politically extracting concessions from Jordan to pull away from Abbas. This shows the weakness of the Abbas position. Now, the Palestinian Authority under Mr. Abbas has long lost control of Gaza to Hamas, going back to the time of his predecessor, Yasser Arafat. There was so much corruption, misallocation, misappropriation, and embezzlement of international aid given to the Palestinian Authority for the infrastructural development of Gaza. The money was essentially pilfered and stolen on a grand scale. But the people of Gaza in their economic plight turned towards Hamas. <clears throat> a civil war ensued between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, in which certain left-wing journalists, such as Robert Frisk, attempted to blame Israel idiotically. Israel had nothing to do with it. It was simply the corruption of the Palestinian Authority and the amb ambitions to perpetuate terrorist jihad by Hamas. That were the factors in that armed conflict that was a virtual bloodbath. Palestinian Muslim killing Palestinian Muslim, just as they had previously done several years earlier in Lebanon. So you have the situation in Gaza that is absolutely horrific. The Abbas Palestinian Authority, that is essentially the heirs of the old PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, are out of power in Gaza almost completely. Now they are losing power in the West Bank. This very closely resembles what transpired with Yasser Arafat. Whether Yasser Arafat was killed by the Israelis in a polonium assassination or not is unknown. His cause of death remains something of a mystery when he died in Paris. What we do know is this, prior to his death, he was completely disenfranchised. The Israelis moved into Ramallah, surrounded his headquarters, and he was reduced to a powerless figurehead who had no meaning. The United States turned against him, as did most international opinion. If you recall, following the hideous brokering of a supposed peace, writing on the back of the Oslo II Accords, Bill Clinton invited the terrorist Yasser Arafat to the White House to meet with Itzhak Rabin to sign some kind of an agreement that has never lasted or amounted to anything. This despite the fact that Yasser Arafat was directly responsible for the murder of an American ambassador, the assassination of the first Afro-American ambassador his blood squarely on the hands of Yasser Arafat, and Clinton invites Arafat to the White House instead of inviting him to go and be put on trial for the murder of this ambassador as a terrorist and a criminal. Well, that all came down and broke down to nothing, as did Wide River. Came to absolutely nothing. Oslo, too, came to absolutely nothing. Yasser Arafat under political pressure within his own ranks, declared this is over, essentially, and used the terms jihad. This resulted in an outburst of horrific terrorist bombings of everything from Jerusalem to bus stops to school bus stops in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, and elsewhere in Israel, including Haifa. This prompted not only a strong response from the Israeli government, but also from the United States and to a degree from the international community. You had an isolation of Yasser Arafat. The rudiments of such an isolation are now a very real prospect for Mahmoud Abbas. 
only it's not only coming from the United States and from Israel. It's now coming from the Persian Gulf, from Saudi Arabia, and from the Emirates, including forces and interest loyal to Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, the crown prince and effective leader of Saudi Arabia at the present time. Things are changing very rapidly. The Palestinian Authority is increasingly alienated, not simply from international opinion because of the United States, but because of Muslim Arab opinion due to Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. And it's happening this week in prophecy. Now we remember, it is the Antichrist who will ultimately broker a false peace in the Middle East that will indeed take place. In the meantime, however, there are multiple quests for that to happen. This week in Prophecy, Jared Kushner and American diplomat Jason Greenblatt have been in Jordan, again reinforcing the demands of Saudi Arabia and the Emirates in order to bring economic assistance to Jordan and its central bank. This brings us to an interesting situation, some would say scenario. Some Christians in various countries have suggested that the false peace in the Middle East predicted by Daniel that will be engineered by the Antichrist has some relationship to the policies of the present Trump administration, that he seems to be benevolent to Israel, that he seems intent on making a peace in the Middle East that Israel can accept that he's standing up to radical Islamic terror, but he's bringing in moderate Arabs. Uh, this could be what Daniel predicted. We can never rule any of those prospects out. One objection to this has been that the Antichrist will have no regard for women. Now, it has been suggested that because Mr. Trump is on his fourth marriage and has had a high involvement with women in the past, although, as far as anyone knows, has been loyal to this, his present wife, for over a decade. They are saying or suggesting that this does not mean that he is asexual or is not interested in relationships of an amorous nature with women, but that he has no regard for women in the way he looks upon them and treats them as sex objects, much the same as the radical feminists who supported Hillary Clinton alleged in the election that he has a low view of women, and that's what Daniel was talking about. This is theologically, however, not a good argument. We know that the Antichrist must counterfeit Christ, and as Jesus was celibate, the Antichrist will attempt to counterfeit that Mr. Trump is not celibate. It's not a good argument doctrinally or theologically in analyzing the prospects of some prophetic significance to what is happening at the moment with the Trump administration. Nonetheless, we do see, again, this quest for peace in the Middle East. That will somehow broker, arbitrate, a apparent reconciliation between the Arab Islamic world and the Israeli Jewish world. Things are moving that direction. We are not saying that Mr. Trump is in any way party to anything sinister or is being demonically motivated. But we do say that we do see a general evolution of events in the Middle East looking towards a peace, and we know that that will ultimately be a false peace. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace reigns from the throne of David in Jerusalem. But let us continue looking at this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, there have been yet more developments the situation in Gaza. We see something happen in Israel, in Russia, and in
in the United States, there seems to be a dichotomy in thinking between the political leadership and the uniformed military leadership in all three countries. Uniformed Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon have grave reservations about the Putin summit with President Trump. So too, the Russian military high command has similar reservations. The Russians distrusting Mr. Trump and the American Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon distrusting, distrusting Mr. Putin. They're not getting along very well together with their own political leadership. There is a definite opposition in the Pentagon to some of the diplomatic overtures being made towards Mr. Putin by the Pentagon, as there are military opponents to the receptive comments being made by Mr. Putin towards Mr. Trump in advance of such a summit. This has included the almost inexplicable suggestion by Mr. Trump that Russia be admitted again or readmitted to the G8, despite the fact that Russia continues to occupy the Crimea without any democratic resolution by popular ballot of the indigenous people of Crimea, and also the ongoing situation and threat to the Ukraine. This has troubled the Pentagon. Likewise, following the killing of perhaps 300 Russian mercenaries recruited from the Spaznitz ranks of former Russian commandos in Syria, there is a dislike of Mr. Trump. They see him as someone who was militarily assertive and not a weak president, the way the Russians looked upon Barack Obama as a weak figure who would draw a line in the sand that meant nothing, whose red lines were a joke. They don't see Mr. Trump that way. Hence, you have a polarization within the militaries. At the same time, there is a diplomatic rapprochement. This is now taking place in Israel along the same lines. The Netanyahu government is at odds with the Israeli Uniformed Military High Command concerning how to respond to the incendiary kite attacks and balloon attacks in Gaza setting these massive forest fires. The Israeli military has suggested that there are legal obstacles to targeting the launches of the kites themselves in any kind of preemptive manner, rather focusing on attacking Hamas leadership and Hamas targets, not the local people who are flying the kites at their behest. As the forest fires rage, however, the Israeli government of Mr. Netanyahu is under understandable political pressure to do something about the incendiary attacks and those who are flying the kites and balloons. The Israeli military is pulling one way, the Israeli government is pulling another way. The reasons for this are complicated. What we do know, however, is the following. Following a massive amount of Israeli military airstrikes against Gaza, including a recent attack that has been one of the largest ever undertaken in the last five years. A total of 45 missiles were fired by Hamas at Israel, seven of which were taken down by the Iron Dome. What we see here is the inherent impotency of proportional response. The United Nations and other countries begin yelling, screaming, throwing tantrums of overreaction that the Israeli response is disproportionate. However, the tit-for-tat form of response, where you 
make a report a proportionate counterattack for the attack on you only perpetuates the ongoing cycle. It does nothing to end it. Some in the Israeli military want to focus on eliminating the the Hamas leadership as the only way to terminate this. But again, as long as that remains proportionate, it's not happening. Meanwhile, for a total of about 85 to 86 days now, these balloon attacks, low-tech attacks, have been continuing. And so we are seeing in Israel a division between military opinion and civilian government opinion. This is happening in Russia, and it's happening in the United States. It's happening in all three nations, and it's taking place at the same time this week in prophecy. Sooner or later, probably sooner than later, something indeed must give. In the meantime, diplomatic efforts to reach some kind of rapprochement between the United States and Mr. Putin and Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Putin have had some interesting results. We have been reporting in recent weeks about Russian efforts, in fact, Russian dictates <coughs> to the Assad government and to Hezbollah to restrict their activities anywhere near the Israeli border. This has caused considerable infighting in the relationships between Iranian supporters of Assad and the Assad regime itself, which is beholden not only to Iran, but more so to Russia. Hezbollah's leader, Nasrallah, has said that only Assad can ask Hezbollah to leave. Hezbollah have been the main pro-Assad forces, opposing anti-Assad forces in the northern city of Aleppo, which was traditionally a nominally Christian base in northern Syria. However, Russia has pushed for the withdrawal of Hezbollah even from Aleppo. This is very, very significant, especially in light of the American naval presence we reported last week in prophecy off the Syrian coast. Undoubtedly, a consideration of Mr. Putin's thinking has been the hundreds of Russian mercenaries killed by the United States in eastern Syria approximately five weeks ago. But these things are again fermenting this week in prophecy. The Russians also warned Iran and the Assad government to withdraw from the Kenitra region which is an eye view of the Israeli border in the Golan Heights. Again, an attempt to defuse the situation. This goes against those who have been cheerleading for a Gog and Magog conflict being imminent. J.D. Farrag and others have been essentially scaremongering that this is a Ezekiel 38 and 39 situation that is impending. Well, we do not deny the potential importance of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Neither do we deny that Mr. Farrag is a boy who cries wolf. It's simply not happening now. Russia, Mr. Putin, are pushing Assyria and Hezbollah away from a border conflict with Israel in the Kenitra region and at the foothills on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights. It is not imminent. The Israelis demolished the home of radical Palestinian Muslim terrorist Allah Kaba near the village of Bata. It was Mr. Kabaha Alea Kabaha, who was responsible for the terrorist attack using vehicular homicide 
in killing two Israeli soldiers, Mivo Dolan, and now the Israelis have responded by demolishing his home. This is a typical Israeli manner of dealing with terror. There will be consequences for you and for your family if you continue to target Israelis. Uh, it is a hard line, and it's a line that has proven somewhat effective. Nonetheless, because of the financial aid that has been given variously by the Palestinian Authority and formerly by the regime of the late Saddam Hussein, it became less effective. Simply, those families of terrorists were given financial inducements to support the terror, even the suicide attacks by members of their families, knowing that the families would be financially rewarded by various other Arab Islamic regimes. Well, Saddam Hussein is, of course, long gone, and there are new pressures on the Palestinian Authority to be compelled to curtail this kind of economic assistance, particularly in the United States and to a degree in Australia, although the Australian political establishment, against the will of the rank and file membership of the Australian Liberal Party, are still continuing to pander to Mr. Abbas. In other words, you can say that all our aid will be designated. But the more aid you give to the Palestinian Authority for one thing, the more money in their own budgeting they can divert to terror. Let us continue looking at what is happening this week in prophecy. In an address to Israeli military officers and candidate officers, Mr. Netanyahu has addressed the, the issue of the development of advanced Israeli radars, including the Fulpin, developed by the Israeli company Elsin. These new Israeli radars have greatly strengthened the Israeli capacity to strike back at any targeting of Israel, even by artillery, but more so by rocketry. Uh, not simply using the Iron Dome defense system, but being able to give a quick response and taking out the launchers very rapidly because of these advances. It is unknown how much of this technology is purely Israeli and how much is acquired from other nations in league with the developments of Helsing, including the United States. Nonetheless, we are seeing these improvements in hypermodernized radar systems, and Israel is at the cutting edge of this. Now, there is a arms race taking place in the sphere of radar and sonar, but particularly radar, between the United States and Russia. The guidance systems for the Russian S-400 anti-aircraft missile systems and anti-ballistic missile systems and the new F-500 are highly dependent multi-operational advanced radar systems as well as counter-jamming technologies and jamming technologies, some of which are airborne. It is technically highly, highly integrated into an in integrated air defense system between the United States and Russia. But Israel, with the development of the Pope, but Israel, now with the development of the Pope, but Israel, now with the development of the Fulton, has become a player in this quest to develop new radars and to be able to outmaneuver, jam, and have effective countermeasures against enemy radars, essential for the guidance systems of both missiles and anti-ballistic missiles, as well as anti-aircraft missiles. This will be very important if there is to ever be a series of airstrikes orchestrated by Israel and or the United States against Iran, which has some of the more advanced Russian missile systems, albeit not as yet a, a deployment of the F-500, 
but certainly the F-400. We have reported it in recent weeks how modified versions of the F-35, specifically the American F-35I, modified specifically for use by the Israeli Air Force, have been engaged in evading these advanced Russian radar systems required to have an effective command and control capacity for the S-400s. Let's continue. This has raised serious concerns concerning the Israeli and American capacity to hit the Iranian enrichment facilities at Fordu and not Khan and Iran, which we reported about last week. Iran is essentially on the verge of re-enrichment and is attempting to use the re-enrichment threat to extract financial and economic concessions from the European powers. Iranian President Rouhani, acting at the behest of the Iranian religious leader Khamenei, has said that Iran will proceed with re-enrichment to weapons-grade fissionable material in, a communica in communication with President Emmanuel Macron. This amounts essentially to blackmail. If you don't pay us this or give us this much in economic support of the Iranian economy, we are going to go back to enrichment as Mr. Trump has withdrawn from this bogus agreement. Much comes into play here, including major European industries who will face prospects of doing business with the United States very difficult, including Airbus and Siemens. Nonetheless, they're essentially demanding money. They're saying, the Iranians are essentially saying, because our economy is being hurt by Mr. Trump and what he is doing and what he has done, we demand that Europeans pick up the financial deficit for it. Otherwise, we will recommence re-enrichment. This has again led to further strategic planning by both America and Israel in response. Mr. Trump has issued a warning, but as we reported, Three weeks ago, modified Israeli F-35s, again the F-35I, two planes have in, made incursions into Iranian airspace in reconnaissance preparation for the potential attacks by the Israeli Air Force, certainly with American backing and technical and intelligence support on these enrichment facilities at Fordu and the Pond and elsewhere. It is all happening, and it's happening this week in prophecy. Also this week in prophecy, the real cost of the Houthi conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Yemen, it is essentially a proxy conflict, has been released, denominated in terms of human suffering. The numbers of people who have starved to death as a result of this at the foot of the Arabian Peninsula are stated to be at least two million plus. Millions starving, millions of Muslim Arabs starving in Yemen as a result of this conflict. And more starvation is likely now, the fact that it is all but ignored by the United Nations, while Israel is continually highlighted for its response to terrorist attacks by incendiary devices flown by kites, demonstrates the absurdity of United Nations priorities and the hypocrisy of that organization and so many of its member states. Millions, millions have starved to death in Yemen on top of the military casualties and the civilian casualties killed in collateral damage. Millions. Over a half million 
civilian casualties in Syria. And yet they are only focusing on the Israeli response to terror in Gaza. What could be more absurd? Nothing. Again, this highlights the reasoning of Nikki Haley, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, President Trump, and Vice President Pence in the withdrawal from the UN so-called Human Rights Commission. Millions and the deaths of millions can be ignored. But if Israel dares to shoot back, this becomes a great human rights catastrophe. It's unbelievable. But it's happening, and it's happening this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the United States has announced that it was Israel who carried out the previously seen as mysterious attacks on Abu Kamel inside Syria, in which 40 to 50 pro-Iranian forces were killed. This certainly took place with the knowledge of Mr. Putin's Russia, and although there was no obvious identification of who it may have been who carried out the attacks. There were speculations it may have been the United States. We now know it was the Israelis. This is continuous with Mr. Netanyahu's policy that he announced that Israel will continue ongoing attacks against the Iranian presence inside Syria. We also know this week in prophecy the substance of some of the negotiations that took place between Israel and Mr. Putin in the meetings that Mr. Netanyahu had with Mr. Putin, as well as some of the conversations that took place between Russia and the United States. Russia has asked that during the Soccer World Cup that Israel refrain from major military actions inside Syria. This partially accounts for the Russian pressure on the Syrian government to back away from Iranian and Iranian-backed Hezbollah military presence in the areas of the Golan Heights adjoining Israel. However, Iran has used this lull in Israeli attacks essentially to resupply the pro-Iranian and Iranian forces inside of Syria that were destroyed by the Israelis. And they are also attempting to rebuild part of the military infrastructure destroyed by the Israeli Air Force inside Syria. Once the World Cup is over in Russia, watch what happens there may well be another outburst of major conflict between Israel and Iran beyond anything we have seen thus far. It is not likely, however, that Mr. Putin will adjust his position. It is not simply a case where he wanted a smooth World Cup and did not want any external military conflicts causing problems diplomatically while the World Cup was going on. Mr. Putin is probably trying to play the longer game at this particular point. However, of this, we may not ever be completely assured. Once more, we do not deny the possibility of an eventual Gog and Magog conflict along the lines of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. We are simply saying that it is not imminent and that those who have tried to make it imminent are boys crying wolf. They're almost cheerleaders for something that Russia does not at the present time view in its interest of seeing happen. We also take note that the Turkish and Iranian economies are in extremely, extremely serious trouble. This is particularly true with the devaluation of the Turkish lira, but also the instability of the Iranian economy 
is beginning to cause political and social instability inside of Iran. We were entertained by Mr. Netanyahu pouring a pitcher of water into a glass and drinking it and offering friendship to a water-starved Iran that is facing major drought problems, albeit not quite yet as serious as what's being faced in Jordan. Today I'm going to make an unprecedented offer to Iran. It relates to water. The Iranian people are victims of a cruel and tyrannical regime that denies them vital water. Israel stands with the people of Iran, and that is why I want to help save countless Iranian lives. Here's how. Iran's meteorological organization says that nearly 96% of Iran suffers from some levels of drought. Issa Kalantari, a former Iranian agriculture minister, said that 50 million Iranians could be forced out of their homes due to environmental damage. 50 million. Millions of Iranian children are suffering due to mismanagement, to incompetence, and the theft of vital resources by the Iranian regime. Now, Israel also has water challenges. We've developed cutting-edge technologies to address them. Israel recycles nearly 90% of its wastewater. That's far more than any other country on Earth. We invented drip irrigation. Our technology targets individual plants with exactly the nutrients they need for each plant. Israel has the know-how to prevent environmental catastrophe in Iran. I want to share this information with the people of Iran. Sadly, Iran bans Israelis from visiting, so we'll have to get creative. We will launch a Farsi website with detailed plans on how Iranians can recycle their wastewater. We will show how Iranian farmers can save their crops and feed their families. The Iranian regime shouts death to Israel. In response, Israel shouts life to the Iranian people. The people of Iran are good and decent. They shouldn't have to face such a cruel regime alone. We are with you. We will help so that millions of Iranians don't have to suffer. The hatred of Iran's regime will not stop the respect and the friendship between our two peoples. The Israelis actually posted in Farsi, in Persian, engineering information on how Iran can better recycle its water and did this as a gesture of friendship. It is obviously aimed at alienating the Iranian secular population from the mullahs and the government's anti-Israel regime as an expression of goodwill between Israel and Iran. Quite a situation. Quite a situation indeed. But we have to bear in mind any Gog and Magog scenario will have to be viewed in light of the greater considerations of Mr. Putin in his relationship with the West, particularly the United States, and also be viewed in light of the dire economic circumstances brewing in Iran and in Turkey for the Erdogan regime. These things, again, are all transpiring this week in prophecy. Finally, this week in prophecy, although not strictly speaking a complete precedent, because something similar happened with the Israel beer scandals in the early days of the Jewish state, where Israel beer had access to major Israeli military and intelligence operations and functioned as a spy, passing those things on via Russia to Arab states hostile towards Israel. We now have the situation of the Gorin Sagov affair. Gorin Sagov was an Israeli government minister who, amidst financial scandals of a criminal nature, relocated to Nigeria a number of years ago. But he has now been arrested by the Israeli authorities in a mission to apprehend him by Shin Bet, the Israeli counterintelligence authorities, for spying for Iran, passing on to Iran sensitive military and intelligence information. The penetration 
of Israel, reaching the level of a former minister of government by Iran, demonstrates that it is not only Israel or the United States who have superior intelligence operational capacities in the Middle East. Israel has achieved remarkable, remarkable penetrations into Iran. But it is very much a two-way street. It will be legally interesting to see what happens to Mr. Gordon Seglov, again, an Israeli government minister, a former minister, with a sinister criminal background who was spying for the Iranians against Israel. It took place this week in prophecy that he was arrested and will now face criminal charges pending further investigations. Quite a situation indeed. This has been This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. If these events in the Middle East tell us anything, they tell us that Jesus is coming soon. Please tell people about him as we prepare the way for his glorious return. God bless.